This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So now we're going to look at information technology and its role in strategic planning and strategic management. <clears throat> it's worth uh, just uh, looking at you know, on this slide at a, a, almost a very quick uh, history or summary of for, of uh, IT that's uh, available. Uh, and really what happened in around the 1960s, people talked about data processing. Uh, this was when uh, wages and salaries and uh, receivables, accounting and so on was computerized. Uh, lots and lots of repetitive sort of calculations uh, happened there. And there was considerable labor saving, nothing very clever, but, but labor saving. And then very quickly people saw that if, for example, you're keeping your receivables ledger, on a computer, then you can get the machine to produce quite useful information for management, like the age receivables listings, or uh, very slow pairs, or maybe even sales analyses coming out of it, uh, customer analyses coming out of it. So a management information system uh, uh, really, I suppose, came in about the 1970s, uh, and allowed managers to uh, access very quickly and efficiently and cheaply uh, to information which was useful for management purposes. Also, the management information systems could be allowed to make certain decisions. Uh, a new order comes in, uh, and the system could check whether or not that would put that customer over their credit limit or not, and you could have automatic acceptance or rejection of the order. Then around the uh, 1980s, uh, we had decision support system is around 1980, 81, 82 that the first spreadsheets were invented and also around then that uh, uh, desktop computers, personal computers were uh, invented and they kind of came together very usefully. Uh, and the decision support system is something which helps managers make decisions but doesn't actually make the decision for them. So uh, a good example is a budget. How do you draft next year's budget, how do you draft the, the, the plans for the next five years? Uh, there's no right or wrong way, so it's very difficult to get the, the computer to do it, but it can support and help you. Basically, you do budgets and financial models on a spreadsheet, and then you can play around, try and what if uh, types, examples, maybe different scenarios that we talked about earlier, uh, to see what would happen uh, if a certain set of circumstances arose. Executive information systems really began to give in the, uh, the 1890s onwards. Uh, the great thing about executive information systems in particular is, is they have to be making rather more use of external information. If you think about what executives, the board is supposed to be doing, they should be thinking about the strategic management, the long-term future of the organization, and they need access to external information to do that. Uh, uh, what competitors might be charging as a selling price, uh, what the economy is doing, what the population of a certain country is going to be. Uh, and a lot of this, this access to external and sometimes forward-looking information was essential for top levels of management. The hope for expert systems, I suppose they came in around the 1980s, or 19, let's put them 1990s here, was that you could uh, 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 extract from an expert how they came to make certain decisions and then automate it. So the hope was you could go to an expert who was very good maybe at predicting share prices, uh, ask this person how do you predict a share price, uh, and then automate it. In fact, it was all a bit of a damp squib. Uh, something like a share price is so prone to external events and random events, you can't bring the, the system up to date. Uh, but external uh, 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 expert systems became a little bit useful in making what you would call complex but programmable decisions. So, so trying to tell people what their pension entitlement to was uh, as a whole series of very complex kind of decisions. You know, how long have you worked here? What's your age? Uh, how many dependents do you have? Um, what are the pensions? Uh, and when do you hope to retire? Etc. 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 Uh, and um, only by answering all of these, these you know, lots of questions correctly, would you come out with the right answer to this very complex series of, of, of criteria. And expert systems were quite good at that. Databases. Databases where you hold all the information basically in one place. 
and you get different give different views of that data to people. So if you had a personnel database, uh, then wages and salaries need to see the wages and salaries and tax information, but they don't need to see uh, information dealing with your staff appraisals. And the database is set up so that all the data is held once in one place, which is great because everyone sees the same data, but you don't see all of it. It just hands you, allows you to see the data you need for your job. Data warehousing and uh, data mining will come on to. Uh, enterprise resource planning should actually be on a separate line in, in here. We'll, we'll look at that, but that's basically trying to tie everything together uh, so that orders and sales uh, and purchases and wages and cash flows and so on are all kind of tied up together. The hardware system typically used nowadays, uh, you have a local area network. This is where you wire up an office or a campus or a hospital or a school. You've got special cables running around it and computers can plug into that. Uh, the great thing is they can all share the same data. They can send emails and so on. Uh, a wide area network yeah, is where uh, you would link uh, people over much longer distances between two towns or between two countries. So typically you have your, a LAN in one place, little network, and then you make use of a telephone system, and then you have a LAN at the other place and so on there. And this allows even very dispersed organizations with branches all over the place, nevertheless to be able to share data and transmit data very, very quickly. An extranet, uh, an extranet is where your intra, in, intranet, for example, maybe you look at the suppliers. So you have access to the supplier's uh, intranet. Uh, and and what, what this can do, for example, it can allow the supplier to look at your inventory. So rather than the supplier waiting for you to send them an order over the system, what you can do is to ask the supplier, you monitor inventory in my shops. And when you see that the inventory in my shops has dropped, then you send the goods. Uh, and this is uh, enables them to, to cut a lot of delay out of the process, make it much more efficient. Because if you're waiting on the supplier sending the order, a uh, big part if you're waiting on the customer sending order to the supplier, the supplier is kind of a bit surprised. These orders kind of arrive at random. And then you have to start manufacturing and dis dispersing the goods and so on. Uh, whereas it's better the other way around. And then, I suppose, starting in the 2000s onwards, people began talking about knowledge management. Uh, and knowledge uh, is of two sort. Really, knowledge is information in people's heads. Uh, uh, and you can have explicit knowledge. And this is basically, it's written down. It has been captured. It's been formally captured. And once it's uh, written down, even on a, a word processing document, you can search for it. Uh, you know where to find it. Uh, tacit knowledge, however, it means silent, it is not really captured. It's in somebody's head, but it's not really shared anywhere else. So a salesperson may know that a particular customer, maybe six months away, is thinking of, of, of spending a lot on a big order. But maybe that uh, salesperson keeps that information to, to themselves. But maybe they acknowledge his power. Uh, and that information is not shared. Now that salesperson leaves and they take that information and knowledge with them. So a lot of uh, uh, current effort is, is put into trying to get people to release this tacit knowledge so that everyone can share it. Um, if it's not released and used quickly, it tends to come out of date anyway. Uh, and, and tacit knowledge in somebody's head and only in somebody's head it is, is it, it may not be there tomorrow, that person changes jobs. So we have to try and get that out. It's important in uh, information systems to realize that people at different levels have very different information needs. So the people at the bottom, the people kind of recording the transactions, if you like, they use what's called the transaction processing system. It's very accurate. It will uh, record sales to the last cent, very detailed. It's almost entirely historical. It, re it records what's happened. 
information is always internal, really. It's very routine. Uh, note that the um, uh, you, you know every every week they do the wages run, every month they do the age receivables analysis and so on. Uh, note that uh, remote input of data over networks, over telephone systems, over Wi-Fi and so on has becoming more common. So people can be going around the inventory with a little handheld device, just kind of counting the inventory uh, uh, and dealing with it like that. So communication systems have definitely helped. But it's accurate historical internal routine. At the top of the organization, where you have really the board level here, that's where we talked about executive information systems. Information tends to be much more summarized. You don't need information to the last cent. You might be dealing in the nearest you know, 100,000. It's very much forward-looking. You're very much looking at budgets. You're planning for the future. It has to be very forward-looking. Uh, it, it tends to be... Uh, uh, the information tends to be rather ad hoc. The reports are ad hoc. They're the non-routine, in other words. And a lot of external information, as we already said. We need to look at forward-facing information. We need to look at a lot of external information. Otherwise, uh, the people at the top of the business are not going to be able to do their jobs properly. Now, said I come back to enterprise resource planning systems. Basically, this is uh, where we uh, try to bring all the information about the company together. So, in the finance, we're reporting on a customer's credit and rating and current selling prices will be there. Human resources will keep an eye on the new recruits, when they're starting, what they're paid, what qualifications they've gained, uh, the, the, how they should be compensated and, uh, and so on. Uh, it will be looking at marketing. It uh, will be looking at sales, selling prices. It would be looking maybe at competitors' prices and so on. You'd have your customer uh, analyses in there. Your, your customer profitability analyses could be there, as well as your customer relationship management. Uh, you'd record your sales, your payments. It would also look after, very importantly, your cash flow forecasts. And in operations, it would be planning production. So an order comes in from a customer. You look at inventory to see what parts are there. You order the extra parts needed, it places the orders, it looks after the invoices coming in, the payments of the invoices, and so on. So typ typical uh, kind of enterprise resource planning systems. Uh, there's a German one called SAP. You may have come across that. Uh, and then I think the other one, the big one is, is Oracle, American uh, one. As I say, trying to tie all aspects, all planning aspects of the organization together. Now, this slide just shows how uh, impactful information technology can be on, uh, say, the uh, uh, value chain. So here we have a kind of skeleton value chain. And the first thing we can look at is inbound logistics. And you may have chosen to do inbound logistics through just-in-time, and you really can't do just-in-time inventory. In other words, lots and lots and lots of little orders efficiently without a good IT system. MRP1 means Material Resource Planning 1. It says if I get an order in for 10 units, then I need so many components uh, to be ordered. So Material Resource Planning. Uh, you can have computerized stores. It knows how much is in stores. You can even have computerized systems, which goes and retrieves the items from the store and delivers it to the production line. In uh, uh, the operations, the production uh, here, MRP2, that's uh, manufacturing resource planning. So not only are we uh, uh, planning the material, we're planning the use of people and machinery. So we get an order coming in, it's going to schedule work. Robots obviously are taking uh, a lot to do with manufacturing. Nowadays we have got uh, more and more importance of things like 3D printing, Uh, flexible manufacturing, where machines can change their uh, settings and change their tools which are on them and so on. So no longer do you have to make you know, a hundred of an item to make it profitable. You make two of that item, then three of that, then one of that and so on. Uh, and the machines kind of switch over very quickly and very flexibly. In outbound logistics, uh, we can use uh, global positioning satellites to keep track of where the delivery lorries are. 
we can use it for route planning uh, and logistics planning and, and uh, the like. Sales and marketing, we get huge information from websites and people's visits to websites. We see what they're interested in and uh, so on. We'll see, particularly in the next uh, uh, lecture, data warehouses and data mining, which are all to do with part of big data. And then in service, uh, we can have uh, total quality management can be helped there. If you're going to improve products and get less repair costs, then you need to analyze where they go wrong and, and move towards total quality management. Frequently asked question pages, help pages, and so on in the internet will cut down the telephone calls to the helplines. Firm infrastructure, we can use executive information systems, DSS, decision support system. We can maybe allow people to remote, work remotely at home and, and so on. Groupware allows people to collaborate on documents rather than kind of working uh, separately. Uh, in terms of technology development, uh, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing greatly speed up the production of new goods. So instead of only maybe producing one new product every six months, maybe this allows you to efficiently produce and therefore launch a new product every three months. It's shrunk the time for designing and manufacturing new products. Human resources uh, planning, uh, CBTs, computer-based training, maybe instead of sending people off to the courses, they can have on-demand training at their desks through the computer. We can help them with uh, expert systems in these complex decisions. We can keep simply sim skills databases. Who's an engineer and who speaks German because we need to send them to Frankfurt next uh, 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 week to, to meet a particular client. Uh, and then we have uh, procurement. How are we going to order goods? And we can have electronic data interchange. An order goes electronically to our customer, to our to our supplier. We can have the supplier watching the goods in our inventory. So the supplier sends us the goods when we're getting near to the reorder level. And again, it can be absolutely required for just-in-time uh, manufacturing systems. E-business patterns is just a very quick uh, rundown of all the different ways uh, in which e-business can impact upon a business. Uh, obviously, there is e-shopping. We get our customers on the internet and they order over it. E-auctions, things like uh, uh, eBay, for example. And there are now things uh, which are called reverse auctions. So the normal auction, the price goes up. Reverse auction, the price goes down. And this is used by companies to procure raw materials. So let's say you had a need for several kilograms of a metal. Uh, you advertise this on a particular site and you say, who can supply me with 10 kilograms of this metal? And the first offer comes in and says, I'll supply it for $10,000. Uh, and then another offer comes in, no, no, I'll supply it for $8,000, and then 7500 and so on. Uh, and at the end of the auction time, it's the person who's offering the lowest price wins the contract. And this is being increasingly used for automatic procurement or e-procurement. I'll go to this one next. Disintermediation is taking out the middleman. Uh, travel agents have suffered like this. Now people tend to go directly to the airline or the hotel site. Reintermediation is putting in a middleman. This is putting in something like Expedia or Booking.com, where the IT system acts as essentially the agent. Countermediation is where the supplier acts as their own middleman. This is something like uh, Opodo. Uh, which is a, a travel site, but it's owned by several airlines. Uh, when you go there, you, you, of course, you get the choice of their flights, not not the best choice of everybody else's flights. You can make money by advertising other people's goods and services. Google can be trained to, to bring up uh, relevant adverts on your site. 
if somebody clicks on it, then you get you know, 10 cents or something because they click through that advert. You can obviously advertise your own goods and services and send out emails to people uh, and so on. You record where they visited, what they're interested in. You can have very directed, uh, 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 tailor-made advertising to people and their interests. E-procurement, we've kind of talked about in terms of reverse auctions there. And customer relationship management, which we talked about earlier on, uh, where we use uh, basically the internet and databases. Uh, we record what people are interested in, what they're buying, what they've inquired about, what pages of the website they have visited, what they've bought in the past, what they might be interested in again, and so on. And we, we try and form this relationship with the company, with the, the customer, uh, rather than simply relying on this uh, kind of random transactional selling and we never know they're going to be coming back again. 